move to postings list compression. The first thing to note is that typically the size of the postings file or, or the space taken up by all the postings lists put together is going to be much larger than the space taken up by the dictionary. And that is why we store the postings list on disk whereas the dictionary is stored in memory. And it could be at least 10 times larger than the dictionary. In fact, a lot more, a lot larger than even a factor of 10. So clearly compressing the postings list is pretty important. So we want to store each posting compactly. That means using as few bits as possible. Now for the purpose of this chapter we are going to assume that a posting consists of a single integer which is the doc ID of the document. So we are not we are not looking at positional indexes here and even in the non-positional index we are not we are assuming that we are not storing term frequencies along with the doc IDs right recall that the term frequency for a particular term and a given document is the number of times t appears in the document and if we have to store the term frequency we will need to store it along with every doc ID. Okay. We will look at the postings list for t and in the postings list for t we will store the value of the term frequency for this term and a given document along with the posting for all those documents. So that is something we will do later on but right now we are assuming that we, we are not even storing term frequencies. We are just storing doc IDs. So again working with the RCV1 corpus, how many bits do we need to allocate to store these doc IDs? There are about 800,000 documents. That means our doc IDs are going to vary from 1 to 800,000. So if we use 4 bytes, 4 bytes is about 4 billion, we can easily fit in 800,000 uh, integers from 1 to 800,000 in 32 bits. Okay, That means each posting would be a 32 bit entry indicating the value of the doc ID when inter interpreted as an integer. Assuming that we are using 4 byte integers. If we really want to you know be more specific we would say that we can use less than 32 bytes because what is the number of bytes taken up by the integer 800,000? That would be about 20 bits. Right, so how, what is the number of, if, if you are given an, an integer n, what is the number of bits taken up in the binary representation of n? Anybody knows the answer? The number of bits in the binary representation of n. Of an integer n. Log Sorry, I couldn't hear. So, so log n to the base 2. Log n to the base 2. Is that it or what if this is not an in, uh, integer? Uh, so the okay, ceiling of that. The ceiling of that. Yeah. So you can test this. If n is equal to 2, this is going to be log of 2 to the base 2 which is 1 okay but actually okay so when n is equal to 2 the binary representation is 1 0 
So the answer should be 2 here, but it's actually 1. So we have to add, we have to add a 1. Okay, so actually the answer is the floor of log of n to the base 2 plus 1. Okay, so when n is equal to 1, this is 0 and we get a 1. When n is equal to 2, this is 1, 1 plus 1, which is 2. Okay, and that's the correct answer. When n is equal to 3, we have 1, 1. So the number of bits in the binary representation of 3 is 2. And let's verify that using this formula. Log of 3 to the base 2 is going to be 1 point something. But if we take the floor of that, that will just be 1. And 1 plus 1 is again 2. Okay, so this the, the, the ceiling would have worked provided your n was not an exact power of 2. If your n is an exact power of 2, then this formula doesn't work. That's why it's better to go with this particular formula. Okay, when n is not a power of 2, these two are actually the same. The ceiling of log of n to the base 2 is the same as the floor of log of n to the base 2 plus 1. But when n is not a power of 2, this is going to be some... Uh, you know, there, there, there are going to be decimal points in this number. Uh, sorry, when n, when n is a power of 2, this will be an exact number. And in that case, we find that we actually need to add a 1. And so it's better to go with this formula. This formula will come up later in a few slides. So that's why I'm going through it in a little more detail. So if we take the binary representation of 800,000, it turns out that we need about 20 bits to represent 800,000. So actually we can, uh, I mean if you are working with the RCV1 corpus, we can assume that we don't need more than 20 bits per doc ID. And actually our goal is going to be to use far fewer than 20 bits per doc ID. Okay, because we want to compress. If we keep it uncompressed, then we would use exactly 20 bits for every doc ID. Okay, so how would our postings list look in uncompressed form? On disk, it would just be a concatenation of doc IDs, each taking up 20 bits. Okay, that is how we would interpret the bit stream corresponding to a postings list. We would take, we would look at it 20 bits at a time and interpret each, each sequence of, each consecutive sequence of 20 bits as a doc ID. And if we maintain this consistency, we don't need to mark the boundaries. The boundaries are understood to be at the end of every 20 bits. But the problem with this uh, uncompressed version is that consider a term like the, which is the most frequent term in the English language, and it's a stop word. And it's going to occur virtually in every document. Now, storing it in using just 20 bits, uh, using 20 bits for every posting is too expensive. Right? What is the alternative? If you recall from chapter 1, we had that term document incidence matrix. Right? Where for every term, we have a row vector whose length is the number of documents in the corpus and each entry in that row vector is a 0 or a 1 depending on whether the term occurs in that document or not. So we can maintain a row vector for a term like the and by doing that we'll end up saving a lot of space because otherwise we'll be let's say that the occurs in every document hypothetically if we use this 0, 1 bit vector, we will use 800,000 bits for the postings list of the. Whereas if we store every doc ID, every posting using 20 bits, then we'll have 800,000 multiplied by 20. Right, so this is clearly efficient, more efficient 
when your term is very common but if you have a term that is relatively rare like arachnocentric okay which may occur in one out of a million documents now for such uh, postings it's okay to store the the, the value of the doc id using about 20 bits okay so forget this then it's okay to use about 20 bits because then if we in in this case if we try to use a bit vector we'll use 800000 bits again right this is going to be fixed if we go for this solution but we need not i mean we may not need 800000 bits for a posting list that is you know pretty small right in other words if we have just 10 documents containing that word then we'll use 20 times 10 or just 200 bits for the postings list if we use this representation or if we use this representation we'll end up using 800000 bits so you can see that there's a trade off for rare terms this makes sense this doesn't make sense for common terms this makes sense and this doesn't make sense in other words for rare terms it's okay to use more number of bits for common terms we need to use less number of bits because common terms are occurring so many times so it makes sense to compress them as much as possible so that the representation of the uh, postings list is very compact but for rare terms it's okay to use 20 bits because there aren't too many of them anyway is that clear so what we will do now is we will uh do you want to take a break right now or maybe in 5 minutes sir right now okay and take a break right uh can we st we can start now so okay so recall that what we are trying to do now is to compress the postings list and we want to come up with a technique for compressing the postings list so that terms that are very common can be represented using fewer than 20 bits and terms that are very rare can be represented using 20 bits so this technique this bit vector technique does not work for this and this uh, generic technique of using 20 bits everywhere does not achieve a compression for the common words so let's try to think of a scheme that will work for both kinds of cases for rare words as well as uh, for uh, common words that is for common words we'll end up using less than 20 bits but for rare words we'll end up uh, using about 20 bits so here's one way you could try to do that instead of so let's say this is a um a term computer in your dictionary and this is the postings list for that term doc id 33 47 154 159 200 and 2 and so on these are sorted in increasing order as always now instead of storing the doc ids why not store the difference between the doc ids okay in other words why not store the delta value between 47 and 33 which is 14 the difference between 47 and 13 is 14 so after storing the first doc id value which is 33 which also you can think of as the difference between the default first doc id value which is 0 it there is no document that has an id of 0 so you can think of every list starting from 0 and then the delta between the first doc id and 0 is the value of the first doc id itself then you are storing 14 indicating that the next doc id is 33 plus 14 which is 47 then you are storing the length of the gap between 47 and 154 which is 
then you are storing 5 which is the gap between 154 and 159 and so on so this is called delta encoding where you are encoding the values of the gaps or the delta between one doc ID and the previous doc ID sometimes it's called run length encoding now the hope is that most gaps can be encoded with far fewer than 20 bits because if if we had just stored the doc IDs these doc IDs would go on increasing in value right towards higher and higher values ultimately close to 800,000 but if we store de the delta values then at least for common terms we can say that the values of delta or, or the values that we are storing actually will not be very large values they'll be pretty small values especially for terms like the and so on where the gaps are going to be very small here so the hope is that most of the gaps can be encoded with far fewer than 20 bits because they are going to be far smaller than 800,000 and also note that also note that the length of a gap has to be less than 800,000 because 800,000 is the maximum value of uh, the doc ID and so the gap the sum of all the gaps has to be less than 800,000 which means each individual gap is hopefully going to be much much less than 800,000 so we can hope to use less than 20 bits for most of the gaps so here's an example so this is a rare term, this is a common term, and this is an intermediate kind of term. If you look at the common term, the doc IDs in the postings list are going to be, so this is somewhere in the middle of the list, so they are going to grow larger and larger and larger. But the gaps between the doc IDs are going to be close to 1, because the is a very common word. On the other extreme, if you look at a rare word like arachnocentric, uh, excuse maybe me, sir. They, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Sir, can you just uh, zoom the uh, page? Can't see the numbers actually. Oh, you can't see the numbers. Uh... Uh, it's okay, sir. No issues. Yeah, I mean, don't, yeah, don't worry about the exact values. Just uh, you know, this is pretty intuitive that for terms like the the lengths of the gaps are going to be 1, 1, 1 and so on. They're going to be pretty close to 1. That's intuitive, right? You don't, even if you're not able to read the values. Similarly, for rare terms like arachnocentric, maybe there will be only two documents containing that rare term, right? And so what I've, sh what is shown in this figure is just two doc ID values. One is 252,000 and the other is 500,000, just two random values. And so the gaps will be larger because if there are just two doc ID values you can expect that the length size of the gap will be larger but then these larger values are going to be very few in number because this is such a rare term and for intermediate terms the lengths of the gaps will neither be as small as one nor will they be as large as 252,000 or 248,000 and so on they will be something like 107 5, 43 and so on. This is for moderately rare, you know, moderately common terms like computer and so on. Which are neither too rare nor, the, nor too common. So the idea is that for rare terms like arachnocentric, it's okay to use about 20 bits per gap entry because the value of the gap entry is going to be so huge it's going to, it's not going to be exactly 800000 but it's going to be you know it, it may be a few hundreds hundreds of thousands in some cases in which case we could go up to 20 bits whereas for common words like the since the gap size is going to stay close to 1 we want to use close to 1 bit per gap entry and in general if the value of the gap is uh, of of, of size g we want to use close to log of g base 2 bits per gap entry 
right that is we want to remain close to the to the length of the binary representation of g as we just saw some time back so the key challenge here is we want to encode every gap size with about as many number of bits as is needed to represent that gap size in binary representation and so we need an encoding that is of variable length right fixed length encoding is not going to work the the smaller the value the smaller the size of uh, the smaller the number of bits we want to use in that encoding the larger the value the more the number of bits we want to use and that is what is achieved by variable length codes they use short codes for small numbers and longer codes for larger numbers so there are going to be two kinds of variable length encoding uh, we are going to look at the first is the variable byte code okay. these are actually many in number there are many different variable byte codes we just going to look at one of them but there are variable byte codes which use a variable number and then there are variable bit codes which use a varying number of bits for numbers of different sizes so in a variable byte code every integer is going to be represented by a certain number of bytes and in variable bit codes we are going to work with variable number of bits but then we could work with something like 20 bits right 20 bits does not correspond to an integer number of bytes but variable byte codes are always going to correspond to uh a you know multiple the number of bits that are going to be multiples of 8 okay so since we want to use close to log g base 2 bits to represent a gap of value g let's see how to come up with a variable byte code for it now suppose that my g is small enough let's say it's uh, of size Uh, let's say g is equal to 5 so what is the minimum number of bytes i could use to represent the integer 5 it's just one right so what we'll do is we'll just represent we'll just represent uh the number 5 by this representation which is the normal representation but actually what we'll do is we will keep aside the first bit of every byte which we are going to call as the continuation bit which will tell us whether this particular byte is the last byte or not in the representation of that integer in this case it is the last byte because we are representing the number 5 and 5 can be represented in a single byte so this is the last byte for it and so we are setting the continuation bit to 1 what about a number like uh, 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 uh let's say a number like 130 so 130 cannot be represented in a single byte but it can be represented in two bytes so we will choose the lower seven significant bits of 130 put it into one byte and we will choose the higher significant uh bits of 130 and put it into another byte so let's say this is the more this is the least significant byte this is the most significant byte so we are using two bytes for 130 so we'll use a continuation bit of 0 here and a continuation bit of 1 so that when we are reading this representation from left to right we will start reading a sequence of bytes whose continuation bits are 0 and then we will end at a byte whose continuation bit is 1 so that is going to decide the boundary of a single number okay so every number ends at a byte whose continuation bit is 1 
and all other con you know continuation bits in general are going to be zero otherwise so if g is less than or equal to 127 note that we can only use seven bits of every byte to represent the value of the number so seven bits corresponds to about 128 or 2 to the power 8 different values so and the largest of which is 127 assuming we start with a 0 and we go all the way up to 127 so if the value of g is less than or equal to 127 we can encode it in a single byte in the seven available bits and we can set c is equal to 1 otherwise we'll just encode the lower order 7 bits and then use additional bytes to encode the higher order bits and these additional bytes are going to have their continuation bit set to 0 whereas the last byte is going to have a con the continuation bit set to 1 so you can with this encoding you can see that larger and larger numbers are going to take more and more number of bytes so we don't have a fixed number of bytes for every number now here's an example of that so let's say the gaps in a particular postings list correspond to values like uh, 824 so that's this is the first doc id value 824 so that's going to be the value of the gap the next doc id is 829 so we're going to store it we're going to store the gap length as 5 so instead of storing 829 we are storing 5 the difference from the previous doc id instead of storing 215,406 we are storing the difference from the previous doc id now each of these values is going to be represented using this variable byte code so 824 is going to require two bytes this is the first byte this is the second byte note that the first byte starts with a zero this is the continuation bit and the continuation bit for the second byte is one and the actual binary representation of 824 correspond to these 14 bits actually the most significant bit starts from here and so these are 0 but 824 is basically 110 0 0 so not counting the continuation bytes similarly 5 can be represented as 1 followed by 0 0 0 0 1 0 1 as we just saw so for a small gap size the minimum number of bytes that will be used by the variable byte code is one even if the gap size is one we will still end up using a whole byte and a large number like 214,577 may require three bytes so two of them will have their continuation bit set to zero and the last one will have the continuation bit set to one and what will actually be stored in the postings list will be the concatenation of all these bytes and note that if we enforce this encoding there is a unique way there is an unambiguous way to interpret this sequence of bytes okay they can be interpreted in only one way it's, this is not an ambiguous code this is an unambiguous code okay so we'll read the first byte 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 we'll note that the continuation bit is 0 so we know that there are further bytes ahead so we'll just take these 7 bits interpret it as some value then we'll look at the next byte see that the continuation bit is a 1 and then we know that the number is ending at this byte so again we'll take these 7 bits interpret it as a number multiply it with 127 multiply this with 127 and add this number whatever it is to this value right I mean you know how to interpret you know how to convert a binary string into its corresponding numerical value I'm sure so that's what we'll do and then we'll start reading the next value so you can see that decompression is not that difficult here we, we all we need to do is just keep linearly reading this sequence of bytes and keep computing the value of the integer uh, we are looking at and once we have completed calculating the value of a particular integer we just add it to the value of the previous integer and we'll get the doc id corresponding to that document so we can decompress this postings list 
into the original postings list, uncompressed postings list in memory. Any questions about this? So we could have used, instead of bytes, we could have said that the minimum number of uh, units we're going to work with is words instead of bytes. That is, we're going to use at least 32 bits or at least 4 bytes for every value, even if it's a very small value. Or we could have gone with 2 bytes and said that we're going to use at least 2 bytes for every integer. So we could have worked with multiples of 4 bytes or multiples of 2 bytes or multiples of a single byte as we just saw or we could have worked with multiples of half a byte or four bits which is called a nibble but the problem with going with fractional number of bytes is that your computer architecture makes it difficult to do these kinds of arithmetic calculations on fractions of bytes it's much more easier to use full bytes or words to, to do these calculations because if you've done a course in computer architecture you know that uh, you know your ALU which does the arithmetic calculation is constructed in such a way that it reads in entire words or at least bytes and you know the hardware is able to compute sums for whole bytes not for uh, you know nibbles Okay, because then you need to store two, uh, you know, two nibbles would fit into a single byte and then, you know, you would need to break apart the word there and that's going to be more complicated. Maybe you can still do it, but it's going to require more processing. But of course, nibbles would work better if you have many small gaps because in variable byte encoding, you're using a minimum of one byte, even if your gaps are one, 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 one you'll be using one whole byte to represent the one. Whereas if you just use a bit representation, they could have just fit into a single byte, a single bit, sorry. But if we go with nibbles, we'll end up using four bits, a minimum of four bits for every value. And that's better than using eight bits. So you're saving on space, but it's more inconvenient to work with. Okay, so variable byte codes are actually quite common. They are used by many uh, commercial IR systems and they combine this, uh, uh, I mean, they combine the characteristic that we wanted that the code should be of variable length and smaller values should be encoded using fewer number of uh, bits or bytes. They combine that property with, all, with sensitivity to memory alignment matches in computer architecture. Okay. This is not done by bit level codes, which don't really work with, you know, uh, which is which is not an encoding that will be a multiple of 8. So we're going to look at that next. And um, I mean, there there is all, always, uh, you know, research going on on how do you uh, pack a variable number of gaps into a single word. Okay. If you can work with word aligned codes. Anyway, you can forget about this. Any questions about variable byte codes? We're going to next move to variable bit codes. No questions? Okay. So let's look at variable bit codes now. And the simplest possible variable bit code is called a unary code. In unary code, this is actually a very, very simplistic code. Did somebody else have a question? No, sir. Okay. Oh, no? Okay. So, unary code is not really a coding that, an encoding that we'll be using for posting this compression because it turns out that this is actually a very bad uh, encoding as you'll see. But we're going to use it. It's going to be a part of a variable bit encoding. This is not an, a separate encoding in itself. But it's actually pretty simple. If you just represent the integer n as a sequence of n once followed by a final zero. 
So the unary encoding for 3, for example, is just 3 ones followed by a 0. The unary encoding for 40 is a sequence of 40 ones followed by a 0. The unary encoding for 80 is a sequence of 80 ones followed by a 0, and so on. Now this is not very promising because, you know, you can see that this is going to be a disaster if you use doc, you know, gap values in unary encoding. But we're going to, we're going to look at this variable bit code called gamma code, which is going to employ a unary code within it. So let's see what this gamma code is. So the gamma code is uh, uh, one of a variety of variable bit codes. Now, the gamma code represents an integer gap value of value g, say, as a pair of values, a pair of integers. The first one is called the length and the second one is called the offset. And the best way to illustrate this is by an example. So let's take the number 13. The number 13 represented in binary form is 1101. Now the offset part, so when we com co convert 13 into gamma code, the offset part of the gamma code for 13 is just going to be this binary representation with the most significant bit cut off. So that's just going to be 101. And the length part of the gamma code is going to be the length of this offset. Okay, this is this has three bits. So we're going to represent the length of the offset in the length part of the gamma code. And this length is going to be represented in unary code. Okay, so the length of this offset is 3. And so the unary encoding for that is 111 followed by a 0. Right? This is the representation of 3. So the gamma code for 13 is the concatenation of the length part and the offset part. So it's the concatenation of 1110 with 101. Now this may sound a little strange when you encounter it for the first time, but it's going to have some properties that we'll look at shortly. But first let's take some examples just to uh, familiarize yourself. Clearly, we're not going to have gaps of length zero, so the gamma code doesn't apply to a, you know to the number zero. The number one, when represented in gamma code, will just be zero. Why is that? Because if we cut off the most significant bit, we are not left with anything. And because we are not left with anything, the offset part is empty. Okay, it doesn't have anything. Or the offset part is the first, mo the leading bit is cut off. So if we just have a 1 and that is cut off, we have nothing left. And the length part is going to be 0. Because there is nothing. And how do you represent the number 0 in unary? Just by 0. And so the number 1 is represented as 0. The number 2 is 1, 0 in binary. So if you cut off the leading bit, you'll just be left with a 0. So 0 is the offset. The length part of 0 is going to be the length of the offset in unary. So what is the offset? It's just 0. That has a length of 1. And 1 represented in unary is 1, 0. So the representation of 2 in gamma code is 100. Zero, zero. The representation of 3, 3 is what? 1, 1. If you cut off this 1, you're left with this 1. So, so 1 is going to be the offset. The length of the offset is 1. And 1 represented in unary is 1, 0. And so the gamma representation of 3 is 1, 0, 1. Let's look at an example like 9. What is 9 in binary? What is 8? It's 1000. Zero, zero, zero. So 9 is 1001. Zero, zero, one. 
So if we cut off the leading bit, we are left with 0, 0, 001. So 0, 0, 001 is going to be the uh, offset. The length of the offset is 3. And 3 represented in unary is 111 followed by a 0. So the gamma representation of 9 is this. So in this way you can calculate the gamma representation of all these numbers. And you can see that the larger the number, the longer the gamma representation. Now there's a property that this gamma representation satisfies. And that property is the following. The gamma representation of the integer g is going to is going to have two times log of g plus one bits. Now let's see why that is true. Recall that a few minutes ago we saw that the binary representation of g Okay, the binary representation of G has how many bits? Log of G base 2 plus 1. Right? We saw that a few minutes ago before the break. Uh, now, if you look at this binary representation, clearly the most significant bit is going to be a 1. Right, the first bit in the binary representation of G is going to be a 1. If it was a 0, then it wouldn't have been a part of the binary representation. Now, if we cut off the most significant bit, we will be le left with how many bits? Log of G base 2 bits. Okay, so the value of the, uh, the offset field in the gamma representation is going to be of length. Okay, so the size of the offset field is going to be log of G base 2. Okay, and the size of the length field is going to be the length of the offset in unary. The length of the offset is log of g base 2. And if we represent this in unary, how many bits will that be? There will be a string of log of g ones followed by a 0. So we'll have log of g plus 1 bits in the representation of length. So what is the encoding for G? It's this concatenated with this, length concatenated with offset. That means there will be twice of log of G plus one bits in the gamma encoding of G. And that's always going to be an odd number. Now notice what we wanted. We wanted the number G to be represented in log of G bits. The gamma representation is encoding G in twice of log of G bits, approximately. So, that's still not great, but it's good. At least we are not... Um, at least we are not... Uh, so, so if particularly for smaller values, if you look at smaller values of... Uh, um, gap sizes, right? Most of the gaps are going to be small, right? Recall that from uh, the previous, uh, one of the previous slides. Most of the gaps are going to be small and for small numbers, the gamma representation is going to be small. Right? So particularly for gaps of size 1 or 2, it's going to be pretty small. It's not going to be much different whether we use log of g plus 1 or twice of log of g plus 1. The other thing is that this gamma code is unambiguous. Okay, We can uniquely decode this code. This is very important, right? The code should not be ambiguous. There shouldn't be more than one way to interpret the code. So like the variable byte encoding, it's uniquely decodable. How do we decode it? Does anybody want to answer? By the way, uh, just to repeat, this is not the optimal way to code the number G. This is just one of the variable bit codes I'm, you know, uh, that's presented in this chapter. 
this is not the optimal way to encode G. With the optimal way to encode G would have used close to log of G base 2 bits and there are more complicated codes <clears throat> that do better than the gamma code. For example, there is something called a, a delta code not to be confused with the del delta encoding that I discussed earlier. There is a specialized code which represents the length field itself as a gamma code. Okay, it's exactly like the gamma code except that the length field in turn is represented as a gamma code. Anyway, don't worry, worry about that. I just want, I mean, just look at this as an illustrative example of a variable bit code that does okay. I mean, it's not great, but it's, uh, you know, at least it's achieving what we wanted, a variable length for different values of G. We don't have to use with a fixed, you know, 20 bits for all values of G. So, coming back to the question, how would you parse a postings list which is a concatenation of gamma codes? How would you decompress that postings list? How would you interpret that postings list to reconstruct the original sequence of gaps? And, you know, from that, the original sequence of doc IDs. Reading the postings list from left to right, how would you interpret it? Anybody want to answer this? Uh, yes, sir. So, I think, uh, so we could start, like the number of ones is giving us both the uh, number of bits of the, the, sorry, the least significant bits of the, Let's say there are n ones at the beginning followed by a zero. Then we know the that there would be n plus one bits in the actual uh, number, mm -hmm. and uh, the most significant bit would be one because we uh, omitted that in the first step. Itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's say we. S yeah, you're right. So uh, basically, we'll start looking at. We we'll start reading the code from left to right, and. We know that the first field that we, we are going to have for the first number is going to be the length field. And the length field is going to be a sequence of ones followed by a zero. So whatever the length of the sequence of ones is, that is going to be the length of the offset field. So if there are n ones here, I know that the next n bits here are going to represent the offset. So this is going to be some sequence of zeros and ones. So I'll just take this offset and prepend a 1 to it. Okay, because remember that while cre for, for, when creating this code, we deleted the most significant one and then we represented the rest as the offset. So if I know what the offset is, the original number is just going to be uh, the, the offset with a 1 prefix to it. And then I'll move on to the next number. Again, looking for a sequence of ones followed by a zero. And what if I just directly find a zero? That means the number I'm encoding is a zero, right? Uh, sorry, is, is a one, right? Because uh, the gamma code zero represents the number one. Okay, that means the offset, there was no offset. The offset has a length of zero, so there was no offset. And so, the original number is, again, prefixing a 1 to it. It's just going to be a 1. Okay. So in this way, we can interpret any sequence of bits uniquely as a sequence of gaps. We can reconstruct the sequence of gaps uniquely from the bit representation of the postings list encoded using the gamma code. And this code can be used for any distribution. That means whether a term is common or whether a term is rare or whether a term is neither too common nor too rare, we can encode any postings list using the gamma code. Okay, and it's parameter free. By that we mean that uh, we don't have to pre-decide, for example, that we, are, we, we will need to store 20 bits for every doc ID, right? How did we arrive at that value of 20? We looked at the number of uh, doc IDs, right, which was 800,000, which is a parameter, right, because not all corpuses will have 800,000 documents. Some of them may have, you know, 
fewer number of documents some of them may have orders of magnitude uh, larger uh, number of documents so that 20 was an artifact of the specific corpus we were looking which was the rcv1 corpus if you take some other corpus we'll have to fix some other number of uh, bits if you don't do compression but if you use the gamma code it doesn't matter uh, all we need to represent is the the actual gaps and the gamma code can do that in a parameter free way that means independent of the corpus we don't have to figure out in advance anything about the number of documents or number of terms in order to uh, go for the gamma code but it's not used in practice and that's because it's a variable bit code and variable bit codes require more complicated processing because they are not byte aligned, they are not word aligned. And since operations that cross word boundaries are slower, variable byte codes are preferred over gamma codes. Okay. So even though gamma codes work slightly better than variable byte codes in practice, because they require more complicated processing, variable byte codes are preferred. Okay, it's conceptually simpler, uh, easier to decompress in a typical computer architecture and the additional cost is not much. Right, here's, here are some figures. Um, the first four values are basically from the section on dictionary compression so just ignore that this is from uh, you know the previous section the RCV1 collection has a size of about 3.6 gigabytes but this includes all the markup and so on in it if you remove the markup that is if you just extract the body of the text in all the documents then that comes out to be about 960 uh, megabytes. Why is that? Because we had about 800,000 documents, right? Each document had about 200 words and each word was taking up about 6 bytes, if you recall uh, the parameters that we had in that slide. Each term was taking up 8 bytes but each token was taking up about 6 bytes, you, including punctuation and commas and so on. So if you multiply these, 800,000 documents multiplied by 200 multiplied by 6, we get the number of bytes used by the corpus and that turns out to be, you know, 8 times 2 is uh, 16, 16, 6 are 96. So if you factor in the zeros over here, you're going to get 960 megabytes. What if we go for a term document incidence matrix? That means, what if we go for a 0-1 bit vector representation for every term? Then we'll have to use 800,000 bits for every uh, term, right? And how many terms are there? There were about... Uh, 450 or 1000 or so terms, right? There were about 400,000 terms, actually more than that, but you can see that this value is going to be huge. It turns out to be around 30 or 40,000 uh, megabytes. So this is huge. This is a, it's taking up so much of space, right? Individual postings list corresponding to terms like the, may end up taking less space compared to what they will if you go for some other encoding. But recall that most of the postings lists are going to be relatively small in size. And doing that for all the postings lists is going to just blow up the space. Right? That's what we saw in Zip's law. There are only a few terms that are so common that using a 0-1 bit vector representation would be more efficient. Right? What if we use 32-bit words? Okay, fixed 32-bit words for every doc ID. Then we'll have uh, 
how many uh, non positional postings did we have we had about 100 and 100 million right 100 million non positional postings that was this was another parameter mm -hmm. value given when we introduced the rcv1 corpus so if each is going to be represented in 32 bit words and uh, so then we'll have we'll have to multiply this with 32 32 bits which is 4 bytes right 32 bits is 4 bytes and so we'll get 400 megabytes if we use 20 bits right if we actually take the log of 800 if you look at a binary representation of 800000 and we if we go for 20 bits then this will be multiplied with 20 bits or 20 divided by 8 bytes so 100 times 20 divided by 8 bytes is going to be 250 megabytes now it turns out empirically okay again we can't mathematically show this but empirically on the rcv1 corpus it turns out that if we go for variable byte encoding we end up with about 116 megabytes of space compare this with the uncompressed version okay, using either 20 bits or 400 bits okay it's even with respect to this this is more than we are saving more than half the space and if we encode using gamma encoding right variable bit code which is gamma encoding that comes out to be about 101 now there's not that much of difference between these two and this is simpler variable byte codes are simpler and so that would be prefer preferable over the more complicated gamma code even though the gamma code has slightly better uh, compression empirically okay so that uh, we are at the end of this chapter now so what we have seen in this chapter is that uh, we can create an inverted index for highly efficient boolean retrieval that is also space efficient okay we can use the same uh, techniques that we discussed in the first four chapters and incorporate compression into them and what we saw in this at least for the rcv1 corpus is that compared to the total size of the collection which was you know 3.6 gigabytes the final index we end up with after compression is only about 4% of the total size of the collection and even if we compare it to the size of the collection without the markup and all it's still 10 to 15% of the total size of the text in the collection but we assumed a non positional index now if you add positional information you can use similar techniques right because now we are for every instead of every posting being a single doc id value it's going to be a doc id value followed by a list of positions within the document where the term appears now again that list of positions can be turned into a list of gaps and that list of gaps can be encoded using either a variable byte encoding or a variable uh, bit encoding so space savings are uh, less for indexes used in practice but techniques uh, remain substantially the sa same okay this is for positional index if we go for positional index the amount of compression we'll achieve will be less okay, we won't be able to compress as much as we were able to for non positional indexes but we can use pretty much the same techniques okay, even though the space savings will be less because now you know we, we are not able to interpret that entire bit stream as a single sequence okay there will be some of them will be doc ids some of them will be you know uh, gaps corresponding to uh, positions within the documents and so it's a little difficult to intersperse them and achieve very high compression 